Working towards building our platformer project, which can be evolved into uh, interactive of about any type, what we need to do is break it into a series of digestible steps. The steps that we will work with is working on getting an object to move across the screen with the keyboard. We will first introduce acceleration and then friction and bouncing and gravity and jumping platforms. And then finally, we will go back and add in images into the project because there's really no point in having the additional layers and complexity of code with images if we can't get it working with basic rectangles because all of our movement collisions and everything else happening on screen is really being decided by a rectangular shape or area that's happening. So with that we want to worry about that because the images are as far as the interactivity of the movement and collisions and everything else the images are just eye candy and we'll see how the image is just placed on top of this rectangular shape that we're working with as our actual player object and then we will be adding in other things like opponents and projectiles and collisions and all kinds of other uh, fun goodness as we move forward. So looking at the first project of acceleration when we go through this for the first few steps the primary file is not going to update or change. So I'm going to walk through what's there and we won't have to really revisit this one anymore until we move on to some of the more complex versions. But we will be looking at the player, which in this case is the unicorn, because the artwork eventually that we will be using is the unicorn animation artwork. So it's called a unicorn, but you could, instead of calling it unicorn, you could use a much more generic name like player and go with that. So we have our basic booleans that we're using with our keyboard so our key pressed and key release that we will be working with and we have left right up down and space so those are our primary interactive keys that we want to use. When we set up and start the new project we set their values to false. False means that the keys are not currently being pressed those values change to true when we press a key. When we release a key, we set the value back to false. Using the switch statement method again, and then we have our different cases, 37, 39, 38, 40, and 32 for the different keys. So looking at the arrow keys, it going in a clockwise circle with the left arrow, it's 37, 38, 39, and 40 as you work your way around the circle and then space will have a key code of 32. Now after that we set up and create our player class the unicorn. You will be set equal to new unicorn and we will call the unicorns update and display methods that it has and then the project will be able to work. Now the unicorn knows how to update and display itself. The main program doesn't need to really worry about that. Going into the unicorn class, you will see that we have added in a few extra features. There's some other elements in here that I left in, these other variables that we will be adding in and giving these values as our project grows and evolves so that they start to do more. But right now we're not referencing them, but instead of adding them in one at a time, it's easier just to leave those as part of the finished class and then as they become used we will explain how they are used within the project. Key ones are width, height, x, and y. We need those. Our vx and vy, so that's our velocity x, velocity y, acceleration x, acceleration y, and then we will have a speed limit. Now the speed limit is an important one because the speed limit is how we can set up how we want this project to move and feel because depending on what we set that speed limit to ultimately will determine how fast our game can be played. So if we set it really low it keeps everything moving at a very pedestrian level. If you set the speed limit really high it becomes very zippy as things move around on screen. Now moving into some of the values as they're being assigned. So the width and height, these values are set a little bit off from the size of the artwork because the artwork is not 
filling the rectangle completely because it's of uh, the unicorn shape, so you have to have the legs, the tail, and other things. The unicorn artwork is 140 by 95, but setting the value to 165 works a little bit better in terms of creating a more appropriate rectangle. So when we apply the unicorn artwork on top of this rectangle, those numbers will make a whole lot more sense. The unicorn is starting at 400 and 150, and its initial velocities and accelerations will be set to zero, and the speed limit will be set to five. We don't care about being on the ground or jumping, and we don't have friction and bouncing and gravity occurring yet. Half width and height, we've used those on previous projects, and with these, we need these values because when we are doing collision detection, our objects, we need to know their half width and half height so we can determine if two objects are overlapping, and if they're overlapping, then that indicates they're colliding. So we need to know those values. And collision side will be explained in coming um, segments of this uh, lecture. Now looking into the update, if left is being pressed but right is not, acceleration x will be set to negative 0.2, right is positive 0.2, if we're not pressing left and right, it's set to zero. If we press up, we get a negative 0.2. Down, we get a positive 0.2. If we're not pressing up and down, acceleration y is zero. Then we add those acceleration values to our velocity. And then we adjust the velocity to make sure we haven't exceeded the speed limit because we don't want our player to get in trouble by going too fast. And finally, we move the players. So we say x plus equal vx, y plus equal vy. So the final step that we do is we move the player. So we do all of the adjustments to that velocity of how much we want to move the player each frame. So 60 times a second, how often do we want it to move? That's why the acceleration value is fairly small. Because we, if we set that value much higher, then we're going to press the keys and watch that it takes off like a bat out of hell, and we don't want that to happen. And then display is similar to what we've seen before. We have a fill color, and then draw a rectangle at x, y width and height. So running this, player shows up on screen. I press the left key, it goes left. I press the right key, it goes right. Notice it keeps on going because we don't have anything to slow it down. We don't have anything. So it's not set up that if I press a key, I move. If I'm not pressing a key, I come to a stop. But once we add this impulse to the player, then it's moving. So as I press the arrow keys and keep pressing, we can see that we go, well, there's no boundary checking going on. So I'm, if I hit the edge of the screen, it's gone and I have to hit the other direction to bring it back. So it's kind of like playing the original video game of Asteroids where once you're moving, you keep moving except there's no screen wrapping going on here. But there's no friction going on, so all we're doing is accelerating. Once I accelerate, there's no force to slow me down except trying to apply impulse in the opposite direction. So then I press in the opposite direction to adjust that movement. So what we're going to look at next is how do we introduce something like friction. So once I stop applying that impulse, we apply friction, which will eventually start to slow an object down. Later on, we will introduce the force of gravity so that as I move up, once I stop applying an upward impulse, gravity pulls the object back down. So we'll be adding those in. But right now it's like a bad game of asteroids because there's no screen wrapping going on, making this really hard if you didn't pay attention to where it went off screen. Moving on to phase two will be friction. So the main file has not changed its contents. Everything there is the same. What has changed is in the unicorn. In the unicorn, we will start using our friction value. So the way that friction works is when we are not pressing keys, so we're not introducing a movement impulse, we need to make sure that we set friction back to its original value, 
and then we will multiply our velocity by that friction value. So Vx is multiplied by friction, Vy is multiplied by friction, and the reason that we have to, when we're not pressing keys, we set it to 0.96 is then that reintroduces our original friction value of 0.96 because if I press an impulse key, left, right, up, or down, I set friction equal to one. And the reason we do that is we don't want our object moving when we start applying that impulse to be having to overcome friction. We want to reduce friction so it starts moving smoothly, so it's not kind of fighting itself. Now we could set it up so that our acceleration value was higher, and then we leave friction always as a constant that would be a possibility, but uh, it's kind of what do you end up wanting to change as you do it. So if I press left, right, up or down, friction gets sent to one, so it's no longer affecting it because then when we multiply our velocity by one, it doesn't do anything. But if we multiply our velocity by a value less than one, every time it's going to get a little bit smaller. So if I go and run this, now as I move, we can see how it slows down. I move and it slows down. Move and it slows down. Now, when we do this, if we decide that that's too much friction, you can adjust it so that as you're moving, everything is a little bit slipperier by setting it. So I went from 0.96 to 0.98. Now if I go to say 0.8 and run the same, when I let go it stops almost immediately. It's still better than coming to a dead stop, but it shows you how just that small change can have a really big impact. So if we even just go to a 0.9, now the world feels much less slippery. Introducing, introducing a little bit of slipperiness makes the movement feel a little bit more lifelike, a little bit more engaging. If you have no slipperiness, so you're either moving or you're not, it doesn't feel as real. It doesn't feel as connected to you when you're trying to in that movement. So that's why it's nice to have some degree of slipperiness, but if you have too much, it becomes very difficult for players to navigate the world. Now, it's also possible that we you could look at in different stages or different states within a project, you could be changing this friction value so that the world is more or less slippery. So there are ways that you could set that up as part of it. So when we start thinking about all of these values that are being defined here of friction and bouncing and gravity, as we look at those, our speed limits, our jump force, all of these values are the knobs and dials and sliders and controls that we put into our project that give it its unique sense of movement, its unique sense of feel, and every project will need a tweaking to those values based on the size of the artwork, the size of the world, the type and style of movement that you're after, for how you're going to adjust those to come up with an appropriate value in the project. Working with friction, where 0.96 is a number arrived at by trial and error, modifying just slightly up to 0.98. Now when we do that, we can see where the world now becomes much more slippery. But if we were to go to a number greater than one, what's going to happen is when I start moving, I'm going to actually accelerate until I get to my speed limit. If I didn't have a speed limit, I would keep accelerating and accelerating and accelerating. Because what's happening with friction is I'm multiplying this friction number 
to my velocity. And if my velocity is multiplied by one, if friction is set at one, it will be like the previous example where we had no friction. Once we start moving, we keep moving. If I have a friction greater than one, once I start moving, I'm going to keep picking up speed as I go. But if I have a friction less than one, then when I multiply it by that, I get a smaller number. So Vx and Vy will keep going down incrementally. But if I choose that number, and remember, we're multiplying it by this number 60 times a second, which is why small differences make a profound impact on the finished output. So if I were to choose something much smaller, like 0 0.5, so I have my velocity, I stop almost immediately. I almost feel like I'm bouncing when I stop because it's so abrupt that we hardly even see any sense it's either I'm moving or I'm not. So that's probably far too dramatic of a number that we would not want to be using as we do it. Moving on to bouncing, where things are going to get a whole lot more fun. If I look, we don't see well, nothing changing in the main file. Go into the unicorn class. And in the unicorn class, when we move into update, let's see, accelerations and frictions, nothing's changed there. Speed limits, nothing's changed there. And then there's a reference to a method inside the unicorn class called check boundaries. So the unicorn is checking to see where is it in relation to the boundaries of the world. So as it goes to check boundaries, what it's going to do is it's going to look at the left, right, top, and bottom boundaries. Whoops, we lost bottom in here. So as it's looking for these boundaries, so if I hit the left edge, we're going to multiply our velocity by bounce. Now if I go and look up what is bounce over here, well, see that bounce is a negative number and it's a number less than one because we could multiply it by negative one which is what we've done previously when we set up boundaries where we'd have things animating that hit the walls we'd say hey multiply it by negative one but what we, what we want to have happen with bounce is when we hit the wall we want to lose some of our velocity some of our energy so when i hit the wall i slow down so after I bounce, I slow back down a little bit. So that's why it's using a number less than one. And much like friction, we're multiplying this bounce value against our Vx and our Vy, depending on which wall is being hit. So if I hit the left wall, we multiply Vx. If I hit the right wall, we multiply Vx. And then we position, so if the x value went off screen, we then reset X so we're at least on screen so we're not running off. That's why we have separate ones for our left and right. And then the right one, it sets it equal to the width minus the width of the object. So width being the width of our sketch as it shows up on screen. And top is very much like hitting the left because we're moving towards zero. And bottom, it now is bouncing off of the bottom. So very similar kinds of things to what we've done before, but instead of just multiplying by minus one, we're multiplying by a value less than one. This number of negative 0 0.7 is a trial and error number. You figure out what works based on your project. And if you want to have more bounce or less bounce, if you do multiply by negative one, you lose no energy when you hit the wall. If you want to lose a lot when you bounce off of something, then you would adjust it accordingly. So now with this I'll mo get some velocity, hit the edge and I can bounce and we'll see how I'm now bouncing off of the screen. So when I have some velocity and we've got that little bit of friction so the world's a little bit slippery I feel like I'm trapped in a cage as I'm bouncing around on the screen. Moving on to gravity. Gravity is where everything starts to get a little bit interesting. The main program hasn't changed. 
but we are using more functionality inside of the unicorn. It is going to change a little bit as we work with gravity. Now we're not going to need to think about things like pressing down because when I have gravity running, we'll see that we fall. So I can press up, adding that upward impulse, let go, and now we fall down. So what's happening here is when I press up, I'll temporarily set gravity equal to zero so I can overcome the effects of gravity. And when I'm no longer going up, then we set gravity equal to 0 0.3. And then we get to speed our way down. Now, one thing that matters here as we do this is when we are falling down, if we leave our speed limit set to the original speed limit for downward velocity, so if I just remove these values here, let's see that we fall really slow. So what we need to do is to find a value, so I could say four times. So if my velocity y is greater than four times the negative speed limit, or for that matter, we don't even set a downward speed limit just for fun. We'll watch how our we can start accelerating downward. So we can try and figure out how we want to apply that. Now, if I want to fall faster, maybe I change that value. So if I go up and figure out what number gives me, so I go up, boom. So you figure out what velocity is going to give you the best look and feel and approach that you want in your project. So we adjust that when I'm not pressing the keys, what do we want gravity to become? Because we neutralize gravity when we press up so that we can accelerate up through it. Otherwise, we have to do things a little bit different, which we will be modifying this a little bit as we move forward into adding in jumping and platforms and things like that. So we will be doing some tweaks to how we go about this whole process and put that into our project. But the big thing is paying attention to our negative or our falling speed limit. We need to let gravity have a higher speed limit than moving left or right because otherwise it doesn't feel the same. Which if you don't want a speed limit, you want your game to be able to, you can accelerate up to whatever speed works based on how you've set things on screen. You can certainly do that, or you can set your speed limit at a really high value. You probably never want to not have a speed limit. You should have some limitation as to how you're controlling the overall playback, otherwise it does get... You run into situations where potentially objects are moving so fast that they're essentially jumping the entire screen in one frame cycle. And if they do that, that ruins all of your collision detection, everything else. So you have to approach how you do collisions differently to prevent people from, in effect, teleporting through a wall. Because if they can move an entire cycle and you're only calculating what are they, are they colliding with something at the end of it, not as they moved through each pixel, did they collide with multiple things along the way. So if speeds get too high, we get some really bizarre things that can happen. So we do have to be cautious with that as we move forward. But gravity is where things get fun. Gravity combined with bounce, so that as you're hitting the ground, you get that sense of bounce. And it's fun. You can go sideways, go up, and bounce back off the wall, and now feel like you're really trapped inside a box. So moving on to part five, jumping. You will notice that uh, at some point I added in a to-do list, and that to-do list keeps getting shorter as we're working our way through. And right now we are on jumping. We'll be finishing today's session with platform and images. Now, there is an addition to 
the main file here and that is just simply to show the velocity x, velocity y, and the collision side which doesn't really need to be here on this one. It will become used on the um, platforms. We need to know which side of the unicorn is possibly touching the platform so that we can adjust movement accordingly. So we'll figure that one out. So uh, the slash n is left over because this is the evils of copy pasting. So that just says put a line break in then we'll have vx and by. So if we look at jumping we'll see unicorn falls down and now it has vx, vy, and collision side. We're not doing anything with collision side yet, but it's had that property since the first segment. Now if I press the up key, I can see that I jump. I can't go all the way up to the top of the ceiling. I can be moving, jump, bounce off the wall. So now things are really starting to feel a little bit more platform game-ish. And if you watch how we have our velocity, we have a speed limit of 10. So it can go 10 left or 10 right. And then as I jump up, we can see that I'm able to only get so high as I jump. To better understand what is happening with that, so putting this text on screen here is just so that as we're developing, especially when things don't work quite right, I can see values that help me to understand how are these numbers being applied into the project. Now I could print the lines out but then it shows up in the console. It's much easier to just keep it live up here updating with that value. So this display position data is going to actually grow a little bit in when we move into platforms so then we can figure out how the platforms are overlapping or not overlapping with each other so we understand what's happening with that. Moving into the unicorn, the top part has remained the same, but now we will be looking at this jump force. This jump force determines how much I get to jump when I press the up key. Now there's a bunch of stuff in here that is still in here that could have been deleted because now that we can't, the down key is worthless because we're going left, right, or up with jump, so we don't really need down anymore. So left and right haven't changed, so we can move on from those. And what we do care about is figuring out when I am jumping. Uh, previously, we had acceleration y when I pressed up. Acceleration y got adjusted by a negative 0.2. So what we, instead of using acceleration y, is we need to modify our vy by the jump force. We also no longer need to nerf gravity because the jump force is higher than gravity, so it's able to overcome that gravity when I push that button. So when I press the up key, my VY is going to be set equal to that jump force. So it's an immediate acceleration upward, and then gravity is going to be pulling me downward every frame. So as I go up, gravity is pulling me back down. But because we're using a much stronger force than the previous acceleration, we're able to now get our object to jump up on the screen. Now, looking back here, I can press up, it comes back down. If we wanted to have it go higher as part of the jump, I could just change that to a higher number so now when I press up we'll see that we go much higher because that initial impulse is high. Something else that's happening is I can press up as many times as I want but once I press up it no longer is registering that I press the up key. I'm going to go back to 10 because what is happening is when I press up and not down I'm also checking to find out am I on the ground because I only want to be able to jump when I'm standing on something. Because I'm not magic, I can't levitate, I can't suddenly spontaneously float out of the air, I have to use my physical capacity to jump. Maybe I have a jetpack, but the jetpack requires me to be on the ground so I can push against the ground, who knows. You get to figure out what your story is. If I go back to the top, we'll see that it starts out that the unicorn has is on ground, it's a boolean, and that's set to false. So when the 
project runs, if I press up while I'm falling, nothing happened. I can't jump until I'm on the ground. And then once I'm on the ground, I can jump, but I can't jump again until I'm back on the ground. So the way that we determine if we're on the ground is in our checking our boundaries. So if my velocity y is less than 1, I set is ground is equal to true, and then I set my velocity y equal to 0, and if my velocity y is not less than 1, meaning it's greater than 1, that means I'm falling faster so that then I want to hit the ground and bounce. So that's what's happening here, but with this bounce, we don't want to bounce the same amount as when we hit the side walls. We need to have a little bit less, otherwise if we're bouncing across platforms, it doesn't work very well. So if I take that negative or divided by two out of there, we'll see it'd be really hard doing a platformer if I kept bouncing that much. That's a lot of bouncing. That'd make it hard to land and stay on a platform. So the easy fix here is to reduce the bounce when I hit the floor. So as I go to my bottom measure, to the bottom of the screen, if I'm moving slow enough so that my VY is less than one, I set is ground to true and I kill my velocity. Otherwise I bounce and then I make sure to position myself on screen so I haven't like fallen through the floor. Now, we could simplify this a little bit just to help understand and remove bounce when I hit the floor. So I can bounce off the sides, but I'm not gonna bounce when I hit the floor. And if I just put these lines here, comment this stuff out. So when I hit the bottom, I'm on the ground, my velocity is killed, and now I uh, reset my height to put it on screen. So we'll see, I come down, hit the ground, boom. Now I'm on the ground, I can jump. So if I'm on the ground, is ground is on ground is now true. If I look back to pressing the up key, if I press the up key and I'm on the ground, so is ground is true, then my velocity y gets set to the jump force is ground is set equal to false. It's this one little line right here that is on ground false. If I comment that out and run this, you'll see that as I'm falling, when I'm in the air, you'll see I'm in the air and I can just keep pressing the button. So I'm kind of pulling a little flappy bird action here. So I don't have to be on the ground to be able to apply that impulse. Now, if that's the case, then I probably need to work on my upward speed limit and set an upward speed limit so I can't keep going or maybe reduce the jump force because that's probably a little high. But if it's like Flappy Bird, there would be platform or the pipes sticking down from the ceiling that I'd try to go under anyway, so I'd never be going You'd always be trying to manage it, but this is too high of a jump force to play Flappy Bird. You need it to be much smaller to make that work. So if we even just go through and modify that jump force to, say, minus 3, now I'm creating, I have to really press it a bunch, and then I'm fighting against gravity. Whoa, gravity pulls it down. So in effect, I've now just created Flappy Bird. I don't have any obstacles, my scene's not moving, but I've created Flappy Bird because I don't care whether I'm on the ground and can jump. But normally on a platformer style world, you need to be on, a, on the ground before you're allowed to jump again. So if we modify it and take away worrying about whether we're on the ground to apply impulse, we do create our versions of Flappy Bird as it goes, and then you just have to figure out the right quantity of impulse that you want to apply. 
it's useful you look at vy as it shows up here and you can get a sense of how it's working now if you uh, don't care about that then you can do it uh, differently um, I like having some bounce when it hits the ground but if we look we can see if we just set when I hit the ground it sets his on ground to true kills out the velocity then you're good to go but otherwise if we wait till the velocity is low enough that then we nuke it otherwise we multiply our velocity by bounce which will then make it bounce up in the air again then we're able to work on the bouncing as part of it. So now when it hits the ground we get a little bit of bounce. If I bring back in uh, is on the ground is false so when I press the up key it makes it, I'm no longer on the ground. Now if you don't like is on ground if that's you know too you know, doesn't make sense to you but it to me it makes sense because we're either on the ground or we're not so that's why I like that but you could call it you know something else or something with fewer letters but by setting that so if I press the F key it makes it false until I reach the ground again so now I'm on the ground I can jump oh but I still have the flappy bird uh, jump force which is that's a pretty weak jump now figuring out how much to jump and put that in you'll have to determine it based on the size of your artwork the size of your platforms how far you need things to move because if your jump is too much you're going to be rocketing through things if your jump is not enough you won't be able to get on top of anything and then you'll be like well this really sucks so you have to find that sweet spot of what makes sense for your particular project so I can press and now as I keep pressing, it doesn't do anything until I've stopped bouncing. So I can't jump again until I'm done bouncing. Now sometimes on a platformer, this is where you may want to eliminate bouncing when you hit the platformer. Because if I jump and I hit a platform, but if I can't jump again right away, that could impede the gameplay. So I may want, if I land on the platforms, to not be bouncing. And those would be some things that we could work on, including as the projects grow more complex. Adding in the platforms requires us to do a little bit more work. One, there's the platform class. The platform class platforms have x, y, width, and height, and then they will have a type. They calculate their half width and half height based on the width and height that they are provided. But the type of platform allows us to, within our project, construct different kinds of platform objects. So we can have ones that could be safe, we could have ones that are harmful, and depending on how we put them on screen, we can then be checking to see, hey, have I collided with a platform? If so, is that platform a dangerous platform or a toxic platform, and should that have a different impact than a safe platform? So that's why we add that type of property into our platform. Now when I create a new platform, we'll see that we set a platform, it gets a X and Y, it gets a width and height, and then it is assigned a string for its type of platform. Now, this is where we're finally adding to the main program. Inside the main program, we are looking at the rectangle collisions between the unicorn and the platform. And this is where this particular function, you'll notice it doesn't say void in front of it. It says string. Because what this particular function does is this one actually returns a value. It returns a string. So I pass into it my player object, the unicorn, and the platform that I'm currently asking about. And as I do that, we will see that R1 will be the player, R2 is going to be the platform. And then what we get to do is we're going to go through 
line by line and start to understand all of these different values as they factor into this. Now this first one right here, this is going to determine, so if the unicorn's VY is less than zero, return none. So watching what happens here, and this will make more sense in a moment, We'll see, now the player landed on the platform. I can jump while I'm on a platform. If I fall off a platform, I'm here, but I can jump up through the bottom of a platform to get on a platform because some platformer games work by, they don't care if you intersect from the bottom, so that's how you get on top. And if I get rid of this one line here, and now rerun this, we'll see how things get a little bit different. Now if I'm at the bottom, we'll see that I can't get I can't get through. So the platform is a ceiling that I have to actually jump to get on top of. So both ways are completely acceptable and good. We just have to know which one we want to use. And now if we look at this position data where it says collision side bottom, previously it kept saying none because we weren't dealing with the collision side. Now we're going to be dealing with the collision side. So we're going to leave it so I can't jump through the platforms and then we'll come back to this one line at the very end and go, oh, now that makes more sense. Looking in the code, DX is going to take and figure out the X distance between the objects and the y distance between the centers of the objects. So that's what we're figuring out here is where from center to center how far apart are the two objects. If I look up here we can see whether we have dx and dy values and as I move around on screen we'll see how they change. So from center to center trying to get so we're almost centered on the x's. So if you can see when dx, the difference between their x's, they're three pixels negative of each other. So the distance between their x's is negative three. I move just a tiny bit, not too far. All right, I can't, trying to get it just right, okay, I can't get zero. Uh, negative two, a little bit closer, and we can see they're almost centered. Now the Y's, we can see that the difference between the center of the green box, center of the blue platform, is 95 pixels in difference. We'll see that when I jump, at one point it gets really close to being zero. Oh. And now we can see that they're off by 45. If we just happen to go look at the height of the unicorn, the height of the unicorn is 65, the height of the platform is 25, and if we then go play with those numbers, we're able to get to that uh, 45 difference between the two if we do half of the width and half of the height, because then they would be moving down. So distance x, distance between their x centers, distance between their y, centers and then we combine together the half width and half height of each object. So this goes back to the rectangular collision detection that we looked at um, in a previous session where we said if rectangle 1 is intersecting rectangle 2 how do we calculate that and we need to know the distance between their centers and we need to know their combined half width and their combined half height. So we need those values to be able to determine are these two objects intersecting. So we have distance on x and y, the combined width, combined height, and then we check if the absolute, that's what ABS, the absolute value of the distance x. Now remember that an absolute value is we throw away the negative sign if there is one and we're just looking at what is the actual number. So if I look at my game here, dy is negative 45. So the distance between their y's is negative 45. But the absolute value of the distance between their y's is 45. 
We don't care whether it's in a positive or negative direction. We just care what is the magnitude, what is the actual quantity difference between the Y of the green box and the Y of the blue platform. So if we take the absolute value of the axis, if that's less than their combined half widths, that means collision is happening on the X axis. Now if the absolute value of the distance on the Y axis is less than their combined half heights, we know that collision has happened. And then we need to figure out, and this is now new, this is where we have to figure out how much are they overlapping. And the reason that we have to do this is once they overlap, we have to adjust the position of the player to make sure that it's not inside the platform. So we have to push it back over. So we have to figure out how much it's overlapping. And the collision will be on the axis with the smallest overlap. So if they're overlapping more on the Y value, then collision will be happening on the X value. And I can see that if I go back over here, so that right now they're overlapping a lot on the X value, but now the overlap on the Y value when they hit each other was very, very small. So they're already overlapping greatly on the X value. Now, it's harder to demonstrate why because gravity keeps sucking it down, but now if they're the distance on the x value is, oh, I, this is where I have to get my skill. So then I was overlapping more on the y value, but then when I bounced off, the x was the smaller overlap. So it's the smaller overlap that determines which overlap I have to correct for, but it also determines on which side did the two objects collide. And we need to know this collision so that we can correct position and also determine should our object then be sitting on top of that platform or not. So if overlap on X is greater than overlap on Y, that means then there are, we need to correct the Y overlap. So then if the distance Y is greater than zero, then we adjust the Y position by that Y overlap. Otherwise, if the distance Y would be then less than zero, then we're going to be subtracting that overlap. So then we'll see something we haven't done before here. And our function is now returning a value. Remembering that this function, this rectangle collision, is not void, but it returns a string. So it has to return something. And the string that it's returning will be top, bottom, left, right, or none. Because then the unicorn is looking for that information. It's going to be asking, it's like, hey, did I collide? And you know, what's my collision side? Is it, did I collide on the left? Did I collide on the bottom? Did I collide on the top? It needs to know what did it collide on. So it's going to return if our overlap is being corrected on the Y, then we're going to return top or bottom collision. Else, that means the overlap is on the horizontal axis, we return left or right. And if neither of those were true, that means we return none because it failed, or it already failed elsewhere on our ifs because if the combined half widths, if, um, if this is not true, then we already returned none. If this is not true, we return none. Otherwise, we're going to be returning left, right, top, or bottom. So this function, where we set the collision side of the unicorn, it's equal to the rectangle collisions function where we pass in the unicorn in a platform. And then we're setting that collision side. Now going back to this line right here, so if our y velocity is less than zero, that means we're going up. 
So we've just applied jump force because jump force is a negative number. So if our Vy is less than zero, you know, it's minus 10 or however much it's been, you know, already manipulated by gravity. But if it's less than zero, then we say, no, we're not, re we're not colliding with anything. And that's how we're able to then pass through the bottom of the platform. Because once I hit a return statement, anything that else that happens in the function doesn't take place. Because once I hit return, I exit this function. So when I say return none, all these other lines don't even execute. When I say return top, it doesn't even read anything else. Once it hits the word return, it exits this set of curly braces. It's done. It's out of there. It goes home. So that's what return does. Return is really powerful. So now by re-enabling that particular line, now when I want to go under a platform, I can jump up through the bottom of it, which makes it kind of fun. But if you want to create platforms that are ceilings that you can't jump through, then just comment that line out, and that means every platform will be solid on all four of its edges. So you just comment this out. Now when I run it, there's no cheating through a platform. I have to get around it because oh, I can't get through, can't get through. So I have to be do a little run and jump. And kind of, or just right, jump and then run. Because while I'm in the air, I am able to apply my left and right impulse. If we want to make the game really rough, then we can also make it that uh, to move left and right, I have to be on the ground. So we can set that in then. So that means I can't kind of jump and then push myself in the air. And that's just, you know, it's another way of working and you can decide that, hey, you know, I want that. So it, it's an easy add-in. So we have to be on the ground to be able to move. So right now, I'm on the ground, I can move left and right. But if I'm jumping, I can't add any. So if I want to jump onto the platform, I have to get running and get a little running leap to get up onto it. But if I'm in the air, I can't. Once I'm in the air, I can't adjust my trajectory anymore. And if that's how you want it to be, then you put that into your project as well. So moving into the unicorn to see how the unicorn, uh, so right now I've nerved it, the unicorn can't uh, move sideways unless it's on the ground, so you can't be adjusting yourself in the air. You can decide if you want that or not, it's totally up to you. But what we're going to look at is in addition to checking the boundaries, the unicorn is going to then check platforms. And it's going to modify what it's doing based on that. So if we go down to platforms down here, so it's updating its position for platform collisions. So as it does this, what it needs to do is it needs to change specific velocities based on which side it collided. So if it, we'll look at left and right because those are easier. So if it hits on the right, VX becomes zero. If it hits on the left, VX becomes zero. But if it hits, so a collision side is right and I'm already moving, we set our VX equal to zero. If collision side is on the left and we're moving, we set VX equal to zero. Now. If the collision side is the bottom, and if our velocity is greater than zero, meaning we are falling, then if that velocity is greater than zero but less than one, then we're going to say we're now standing on the platform and kill the velocity. Otherwise, we're going to bounce when we hit it. So this is the same code. It's the same code, 
that was in check boundaries for hitting the bottom. So when we, that's telling us when the bottom, so when we say top left, right, and bottom inside the game, if we look at the collision side, it says now bottom. Now if I go and hit it from below, well, I can't quite see it, it refreshes too quickly. Um, but it's saying top right there when I hit it. Because we're talking about the bottom of the green box, the bottom of the player. That's what we're caring about, not the top. So we're not saying which side of the platform did we hit. We're saying which side of the player is colliding with the platform. That's important. So if I, the player, the unicorn, it's touching the platform on its bottom and it still has some velocity, and then we determine what to do for killing that velocity. And then we have top, right, and left. Now we can look down here. So if the collision side is not the bottom, meaning I'm not standing on the platform and my velocity is greater than zero, then I'm able to then keep his ground false, which I think I might be able to eliminate that right, right now, but we'll leave it for the moment. So checking platforms, it doesn't care which platform I'm hitting. So this is important as we move forward and want to add in multiple platforms. This checking platforms really could be renamed as check platform. It's just finding out how to adjust its position based on whatever platform it's currently interacting with. So looking back at the main program, the main program, it, what happens is it cycles through any platforms in the project and it sets the collision side based on that information. So it's going to get a little bit different. We'll implement this slightly different when we add in multiple platforms. So if we have a whole bunch of platforms on screen and we're jumping between platforms, how do we figure out what is our collision side value and set that up? Adding images into the project allows it to grow increasingly more interesting. Looking at the file structure, we'll see that the images are inside the data folder. Now in this case, there are 24 images. With that, what's important to keep in mind is we have a series of images that correspond to different animations. So I have the basic unicorn facing in one direction, unicorn facing in the other direction. Then we have the different walk cycles that go with that, as well as the stationary animation that factors into the project. So all total, there are 24 images that are part of this project. So all 24 images get loaded using the number formatting option. We'll see that it uses uh, four numbers. They start counting at one. So that's why it's using the I plus one because it starts out the first image is one, the last is 24. So because it didn't start at zero, we had to format it in this manner. Now, nothing else has changed in the main file from what we just looked at. So the next thing to look at is inside the unicorn, how is it implementing the images? It's doing it a little bit different. Instead of having two separately named groups of images, what it's instead doing is having a frame offset. So it's going to loop through a series of frames based on that frame offset. Now, if we look through under these images, the current frame, well, we'll start that out at zero. And we need to know whether we're facing left or facing right so we know which uh, set of images we want to use. Each frame sequence is six frames long. And we'll start out with our frame offset at zero. Now, the reason each frame sequence is six frames long, there's 24 frame sequences because we have a walking animation left, walking animation right, standing animation left, standing animation right. Each one is six frames long. So that when I run the project, 
we can see there's the unicorn, there's the standing animation right, standing animation left. When I'm walking, I have the different walking animations that factor into it as well. You will notice that the artwork extends beyond the green box. So I've determined that I want the green box to be the active area for my artwork animation, even though the pixel artwork is actually bigger than what we see on screen. So when I draw the actual images, I am offsetting them from the X and Y position of the box so that my box area is the actual active area. So if I wanted to play my whole project, I'm concerned about box on box. I'm not concerned about the pixels of what I see here. So his tail isn't enough to keep him on screen. And his head, oh, he can go through the platform. Let's just modify that so he can bounce off the platform. So his head will hit the, go into the platform, but his body won't preventing him from going on screen. And if that's the case, we may want to then rethink not having it bounce. So we can see he's going to hit his head into it, but his body is where he gets stopped because it's based on the green box. Now the green box, as it, again, the width and height is the green box, not the pixel dimension, because the pixel dimension is 140 by 95. Now the frame sequence and offset, if we, uh, facing right is so we know if we're, which set of frames we want to be looking at. So if I press left, facing right is false. If I press right, facing right is true. That's all we really care about on that. And we just set those there. And because it starts out with facing right true, We'll just start out with that. So we set that to true when we begin the project. But if I press left, it becomes false. Press right again, it becomes true. That's it. Those are the only places that that changes. Now we use that as part of our display information when we're trying to figure out how to show this on screen under display. So if I am facing right and my velocity is greater than zero, meaning I'm not parked, then I'm going to show one set of frames. Otherwise, I am going to offset that grouping of frames by a certain amount. We can see that offset is 0, 12, 6, or 18. So these are the offsets that we're offsetting the frames. Um, So if we are facing right and I am moving, I want to see the first six images in my project. Otherwise, that means I'm parked and I will look at not the first six, but then I will be looking at uh, 12 through 18. So we have 1 through 6, or 7 through 12. 13 through 18, and the 19 through 24 would be the images that correspond to each animation sequence. So with that, the first set of frames I know correspond to I am moving or walking to the right. The second set of six correspond to moving or walking to the left. The third group of six correspond to my standing still and animating. And the final group of six correspond to my standing still facing left and animating. Notice that the X and Y are being offset. They're not positioning it, so that shifts the display of the pixels. Because where we see the unicorn on screen is irrelevant in terms of where we see it compared to where the green box is. and because the pixels of the unicorn are irrelevant. The only thing that actually matters for gameplay is where is this green rectangle? Now if I decide that that green rectangle, I want to make it a little tighter. So I pull it tighter to his body to make it more precise. We could certainly do that. If you make your artwork fill the rectangle better, you don't have to take these kind of hacks and offset it. So it depends on how you build your project. Now in a previous session, I was challenged with how do we 
figure out how to build the animation. Now we'll see that current frame gets set to zero if I'm not on the ground, but if I'm on the ground, just when I'm jumping, it just locks it so we don't have a jump animation and in the air it just grabs frame, um, which you could modify that if you wanted. So when you're jumping, we could have yet one more sequence or two more sequences that's doable too. But otherwise, when I'm jumping, it locks it on that so it's not animating. Otherwise, if I'm walking or standing still, then it goes into the animation sequence. And we migrate through the frames in this one line method. So before it was current frame plus equals one. If current frame is greater than the number of frames, current frame is equal to zero. So we use that method before. Instead, what we can say is current frame is equal to current frame plus one, the math modulus operator, and then my frame sequence. My frame sequence happens to be six. So if current frame it starts out at zero, then we set current frame equal to current frame zero plus one, that would be one. One divided by six, and then we end up keeping that remainder. So one is not able to be divided by six, so it ends up being zero with a remainder of one. So if you remember back to your math days, uh, in current math um, things, most people are like, well, everything should just be a decimal. Why do we ever use remainders anymore? This is one of the few occasions where using a remainder is useful. Because the way that this math op modulus operator works is we say, do division. We don't care how many times it goes in. We just want to know what is the remainder of this division equation. So if it starts out, current frame was zero, now current frame is equal to current frame plus one, so that's one, divided by frame sequence that's zero, that would be zero remainder one. Now the next time, current frame was one, so that's now one plus one, that's two, two divided by six would be zero remainder two. And then when we get all the way up to six, so when current frame is six, six divided by six, the equation is one remainder zero. So we end up creating this loop of zero, one, two, three, four, five, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and it just keeps repeating and repeating and repeating indefinitely. So this is how we're able to create that same thing we did with multiple lines and an if statement in a single line of code.